four. I'm going to be talking about single-minded devotion. I believe it's on um, page 1607, but we're going to be reading chapter four. So we're going to be talking about a little bit of things here tonight. It's very important. Let's pull your finger there. I want to share something with you. So it's going to be James chapter 4. It's going to be a single-minded devotion, step 3. How's everybody doing tonight, all right? Good. Good, good to see everybody. Glad to be here. I'm glad yeah, to be here, too, to start off the week in, yeah. a, in a good, yeah. positive note, right? It's always good to do that. All right, hold your finger there. Sometimes, okay, believing that he cares for us can be a difficult thing, Okay. We may have experienced tragedy, abuse, or other suffering that has caused us to lose faith in his care. Okay? From our past life experiences, we can draw erroneous conclusions about God and his character. We may try to win his favor by being good, or at least by appearing to be good. You know the face, the church face. Shame about our behavior during our addictive or our sin nature acting out may have us thinking that we are outside the grace of God and that he is just waiting to punish us. Yeah. I was always raised with a punishing God. The church I used to go to, God's looking down on you and if you don't go to confession, he's gonna, you know, it's going to get you. And I'm like, duck, oh boy, <laughs> I better hide under a rock or something. I haven't been that good lately. Like ever. <laughs> but anyway, so how do we turn our will and over to our lives over to the care of a God that we do not trust? Our lives are in the balance, wavering between the painful chaos of addiction or our sin nature, our dependencies, and the offer of a new life through recovery. To make this decision, we affirm that we have taken a stand so that we can live. As Moses said in Deuteronomy 30, verse 19, we have a choice to make, <clears throat> life or death. In our case... Will it be addiction or recovery? Are we choosing the path that leads to death or the life? Although the life of addiction screams at us to seek perpetual excitement, or perhaps it is numbness we seek, we have to believe that the life God has for us is infinitely better, richer, and more satisfying. We don't have to explain God or understand Him, we just need to surrender our lives to Him. As we choose to draw close to God, God brings His reconciliating love and redemptive, redemptive purpose into our lives. In step one, we admitted that we do not have the power over addiction or over anything in our lives. In step two, we acknowledge that God does have power to heal addiction and our sin nature and to work in our lives. Now in step three, we decide to turn everything over, let go, and ask for help. When our self-will is out of the way, God can work in our hearts. There's an amen there, right? Amen. There, may be, there may not be immediate results. This is one thing we have to understand. But in turning it all over to God, we exchange our heavy burdens for the rest in peace that Jesus brings. The, we, the weariness of an addictive life can be exchanged for rest. We don't struggle or fight the addiction off. We let go by letting the fight be his. We let Jesus get in the boxing ring with our compulsive desires while we rest on the sidelines free to do his will. Over time, the obsession is relieved. It's all in God's hands now. As we choose to give our will, our thinking, our decisions, and our behavior to the care of God, we rest in the belief that he cares for us. He is with us no matter what life throws at us. With his power and presence, we are able to stop acting out in the circumstances of our sin nature. We are becoming free from bondage of life-stealing addiction. The third step decision to allow God to take over our whole life is the foundation of subsequent actions we will take to work the remainder of the 12 steps. And, um, has so anybody locked the doors yet? Dave. No, let Dave do it. Dave will do it. Dave, go lock the doors. Oh, this one here and the one in the bottom. The devil's out, see? Yeah. Causing right. distraction.
Would it fall off? Yep. That's weird. That was really weird. Of course, he wants to distract us. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. Once we get distracted, it's hard to get me focused. That's just exactly what he does. All right, is everybody in James chapter 4? Yeah. All right, I want us to turn, all right, to James 16.05, okay? Now, I want to talk about wisdom right here. See the wisdom part? 16.05. says wisdom. See it? When we get caught up in catering to our addiction, it's almost like we are two different people. Right? As if there are two of us tied up together. The Bible recognizes this dual nature in each of us. You know that Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde nature? Mm -hmm. Right. One part yearns for good, and the other part is drawn towards corrupt desires and animal passions. Tell me about it. The Bible describes a kind of worldly wisdom that justifies destructive behavior and leads to disorder, instability, and confusion. We need, to beware, be, we need to beware of this type of wisdom, which is characterized by jealousy and selfishness. James wrote, for jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. Imagine he calls jealousy and selfishness demonic. It is demonic. Yeah. Definitely. It, it, such things are, uh, for wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, you will find disorder and evil of every kind. And that's so true. This kind of thinking causes us to focus on what others are and have. It makes us envy others so much that we are always dissatisfied. It is easy to become so consumed by our own desires that we become inconsiderate of others often hurting the people we love. This type of wisdom is inspired by the devil and will lead to our ultimate destruction since Satan's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. John 10.10 10. If our thoughts are still dominated by jealousy and selfishness, we need to ask God to replace our earthly wisdom with his godly wisdom. We can trust him to change our mind in our life. I'm a big amen there. Amen. One thing about the devil, he's very subtle, you know. He makes us do things that are bad for us without, a, without an instant result from being bad. We get away with it for quite a long time until the results show up later. That, you know, so like somebody that smokes. They smoke cigarettes, but they don't get any um, instant result from that cigarette for so like 20 years down the road when they end up with lung cancer or with somebody that does drugs or whatever that kills their kidneys and their liver, or to somebody that drinks that kills their liver, and over time, what, their liver disintegrates, and then, then before the time, you know it, it's too late, and then before they stop because they have to, not because they want to. So we understand that the devil makes us feel good in the moment, but the, at the end result is death. God gives us, he kills off our flesh in the moment so we can have life in the end. So that's how it works. It's called delayed gratification. When we ride it out, trust him. Instant gratification. So I can't take this anymore. I gotta go somewhere. I gotta do something or buy something to get that instant relief that we want, whatever it might be. But ultimately, it's gonna cause us problems later when we feel guilty and shameful that we did it. I get me many. But when we don't do it and we fight it off, at the end of the day, we're like, "Wow, I feel so much better that I didn't do that again." Yeah. Get it? But when you keep falling into it, you just the worse and get feel worse and worse and worse. The devil has you in his grip, and he won't let go. Or you can come to church the rest of your life and just let the devil keep controlling you, if you if you choose to, because it's a choice you have to make. That's why in step three we have to make a decision to turn our will and our lives over to His care. Amen. Amen. All right, let's read step three: single-minded devotion. And this is most of the problem for Christians. They're still double-minded here. It's on 1607. We may have already chosen to follow God, letting Him define the overall direction of our life. Even so, many of us still try to keep parts of our heart hidden from God. We have devoted these parts of ourselves to gratifying our addiction, to doing things that are contrary to the will of God. 
This sets us up for living a double life, which can fill us with guilt, shame, and instability. Did I just say that? Mm -hmm. Did I just mention that? That that's what it does. You live a Christian life, but you're living a double life. Mm -hmm. And you're worse off than you ever were. Even those of us who have given our heart to God face new temptations and decisions every day. James was addressing believers when he wrote, So humble yourselves before God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come close to God, and God will come close to you. James 4, 7, 8. If we choose to live a double life, we may begin to doubt whether God hears us at all. As James wrote, a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they are unstable in everything they do. When we resist the devil at every turn and draw close to God, he will draw close to us. When we open the hidden portions of our heart and begin to make choices in favor of recovery, we will soon grow confident that God desires to help us. Amen. Amen. So he says we live as a double life. So we come to church, we read our Bible, we come to recovery group, but when we're not here, we're still living the way the devil tells us to live. Then we come here, we feel guilt and shameful, then we go back and do it again. And then it says, well, if you're going to do that, don't expect God to help you. He won't help you. You're making a choice against his will to do something that's going to destroy your life. And God doesn't want you to destroy your life. He wants to save your life, but the only way that's going to happen is if you trust him and do things the way the Bible lays out. You can't do things your way and his way. It'll never work. It says you end up becoming deformed. Right? All right, so let's read James chapter 4. This is so powerful. This chapter. Now, in, in the first chapter, in the first verse of all, Chapter 4 says, drawing close to God. What is causing quarrels and fights among you? Do you still quarrel and fight? Sure. We're all Christians. Should we be? Should we be quarreling and fighting with our loved ones, our spouse, yeah. people at work? Should we be? Yep. No, we should be accepting things the way they are, yeah. trusting that God is in control and he's trying to change us in the process, not them. Mm -hmm. yep. Don't think, that's what it says. It says, what is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you want. Why? Because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. Mm. I'll put a big amen there. Mm. I love it. Now, the Bible calls you an adulterer if you're doing that. Everybody thinks adultery is just with, like another woman or another man. No, your adultery is when you do things against God's will. Yeah. You adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again, if you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. What do you think the scripture means when they say that the spirit God has placed within us is filled with envy, but he gives us more grace to stand against such evil desires? As the scriptures say, God opposes the proud, but favors the humble. Now, you see what it says right here in verse 6? He says, but he gives us more grace to what? Keep doing evil? No. No, it says to stand evil. against evil. Yes. The grace is to stop doing the evil, not to stay in it. Right. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of false teaching out there in churches that telling you that God's grace gives you the, right. the license to do whatever you want and be evil. But it says he gives us the grace to stand against evil desires. As the scriptures say, God opposes the proud and favors the humble. So humble yourself before the Lord. Resist the devil, and he will flee. Amen. Come close to God, and God will come close to you. Now let me tell you this. When you're doing something against God, are you getting close to God or farther from him? Mm 
Father. You get farther from them. When you go do something worldly, you're drawing yourself further from God. But you, you know, you can play religion all you want, come to church and pray and do all this, but you're still going against God. It doesn't matter. God doesn't honor that dual nature. He says your motives are all wrong. It tells us to resist the devil and he will flee. Come close to God and God will wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. And let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up and honor. What he's saying it is, he wants, God wants your sin nature to what? Make you feel crappy, not feel good. He wants it to what? It says, let there be sadness instead of joy when you're doing that. Let there be what? And let there be sadness instead of laughter, gloom instead of joy. When you're doing something against God, it's supposed to cause what? Pain and suffering in your life, not joy and pleasure. Mm -hmm. See, when you're a Christian, your spirit wars against that nature, and you don't want to do that anymore. But when you still want to stay in your flesh, you want that and you still enjoy it. Mm -hmm. See, God changes our desires so we don't want it, so we hate it. Yeah. Paul, Paul was saying in Romans 7, he hated his sin nature. Mm -hmm. He hated doing the things that he was doing. He didn't love doing that. You can't use that scripture and if you still love doing it. He says he did the things that he hated. See, his, his new nature warred against his old nature. And when he fell into his old nature, <laughs> he hated it. He didn't go in there and get more pleasure. He hated it. He got, what, deep sorrow and grief from doing it. Not pleasure and relief. Can I get any men here? Yeah. That's when you know that you're being converted and you're changing. Mm -hmm. when, you get, when, when you go to get relief from something in the world, it doesn't do what it used to do anymore. Right. It makes you feel worse. See, that's God who puts that in. You say, wow, this isn't working anymore. <laughs> this stuff I'm doing to, to, to relieve myself is making me feel worse. And that's God's spirit inside you. You know, giving you the nudge to stop doing it. So he's going to make it so when you get pleasure out of it, that's how you know you're being controlled by the devil. Mm -hmm. When you're doing it and you hate doing it, then you know you're being controlled by the spirit. Can I get an amen? amen? You can play religion all you want, but that's what the telltale sign is. When you do something that you hate, that when you used to do something, when you used to do it, you used to love it. Now when you do it, you hate it. Amen. We still have that in us. We have to understand that we still have a sin nature stuck in us geared towards doing that over and over again. Can I get an amen? Yeah. But there's a difference. There's a conversion. We don't want that anymore. But it's so ingrained in us that we run to it whenever we feel what? Lonely or we feel angry or overwhelmed. We reach for something that, that's going to relieve us of that instead of Jesus. But then we come to church saying, no, I love Jesus. He said, no, you don't. Don't lie. You love that. That's your Jesus. What you're running to is your Jesus. You see? But you can play Christian all you want. You might be able to fool me and everybody else, but you can't fool God. So you can not You can come to church all you want, but you'll never relieve that. Jesus will never satisfy that because that's, only, that's the devil. Can I get an amen? amen. You have to understand that will never satisfy a Christian anymore. Once you get converted, like I said, from a catapult to a butterfly, once you make that decision, you can't become a caterpillar anymore. If you can, then you never were a butterfly. Can I get any amen? Really. If you remain a caterpillar, you will never were a butterfly. Right. You can't go backwards. Once you're converted, it's, it's, once you get into the cocoon and come out the other side, now when you do something, you hate it. Mm -hmm. You see? You might still do it, but you hate doing it. Because mm -hmm. we have this sin nature in us that wars against our new nature. Mm -hmm. See, we're born into sin. The Bible tells us that you're born... Without God, against God, everything you do is selfish and self-centered, and it's all about you. Mm -hmm. Until you get converted, when it becomes all about Him, when you do things that are all about you, you get what? You feel bad because you didn't want to. You wanted to do something good for God. Instead, you were selfish again and doing it for you. You know, you were representing the ministry. You said, "No, I represent the ministry. I'm not going to do that." Right. And the people. I want to pray for them. I want my prayers to get answered. I don't want to hinder my prayers, and I don't want to be the one doing it. So if you're living a sinful life and praying, and then the prayers ain't getting answered, that's why. Because you're living a double life. And God's not going to hear you. He's like, what? I don't hear you. The devil's listening to you. <laughs> yes. Can I get a big amen here? Yeah, you have to understand. 
The human heart is so deceitful. We can deceive ourselves by being religious, coming to this group, going to church, doing it, but never making the changes that God asks us to make to become like Jesus. It's a sacrifice. It's called crucifixion of the flesh. And it's painful. The only way something's going to die in your life is if you stop it. If you keep feeding it, it's going to stay alive. If you're feeding an addiction, it's always going to control you. If you stop it, then the spirit is going to start to control you. See, the spirit is the governor of a, of a, of a, of a Christian. It governs your appetites. So you don't overindulge in anything. And you're satisfied because you have the Holy Spirit satisfying you instead of whatever it is that you're trying to indulge in. Can I get any man yeah. But if not, if you're not trusting God, He lets you go and run full force into the sin like He did before. Remember, they want, it quite, they want meat. I don't want, I don't want manna anymore. I'm sick of manna. We want meat. And they complain. Instead of wanting God, they wanted meat. So God said, you want me? Okay. So he threw full force into the quail. So they were throwing it up. They had so much of it. That's what he does with our sin. He says, you want sin over me? Here you go. You start to overindulge in everything that you throw it up and say, I don't want this anymore. Yeah. That's what he does. He lets you go full force into it till you hate it. Yeah. That's the only way it's going to happen. Or else you're going to love it for the rest of your life. It's way over there. <laughs> yes. okay. Is it there? But anyway, you get my point? You can't get this by just coming. You have to believe it and actually do it for anything to happen in your life to change. Then you have to say, I don't need to change. If you say I don't need to change, well, that means you don't need Jesus. Because we need, we need to get saved from ourselves. Yeah. We're the problem. He's the solution. The result is a miracle, a changed life. A changed life is the evidence of your salvation. If you're not changed, then you're not saved, because you can't be. Because you're still living with you're still living without God. Can I get an amen here? Yeah. Yeah. People don't understand the principle. You have to understand the Bible, the way it's written. Okay, now let's read about this one. Warning against judging others. How many of us still judge people? Don't answer that. Just take a look, just think about what I'm saying. I'm not talking about judging people in church, even though you still do that. I'm talking about judging outside people. People that are not Christian. People that are in the world, kids, whatever, judging what they're doing and trying to change them. Let's see what it warns us about. Don't speak evil against each other, dear brothers and sisters. If you criticize and judge each other, then you're criticizing and judging God's law or God's word. Imagine. But your job is to what? Obey the law, not judge whether it applies to you. God alone, who gave the law, is the judge. He has this power, he alone has the power to save or to destroy. So what right do you have to judge your neighbor? Warning about self-confidence. Look here, you who say, today or tomorrow we're going to a certain town and we'll stay there for a year. We will do business there and make a profit. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? <laughs> Your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, then it's gone. Mm -hmm. What you ought to say is, if the Lord wants, or God willing, yeah. us to will to, well, wants us to, we will live and do this or that. Otherwise, you are boasting about your own plans, and all such boasting is evil. Don't we have a twisted sense of what sin is and what's not evil? Yeah. It's, isn't it bad? We think that sin is like, oh yeah, that drug addict and the murderers, they're all evil. But it's telling us right here, boasting about your own plans or your own, or your own achievements is evil. And then it says, remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. So when you, here's one thing about, here's one thing that Christians don't understand. Once God enlightens you, okay, Unbelievers, he gives us them a pass because they don't know him. But once you accept Jesus into your life and you choose knowing that it's wrong, right? 
Then it's a, it says, remember, it's a sin to know what you ought to do or not to do it. It's a sin. God will come down on you a lot harder because you're actually rebelling against God because he taught you and he told you what to do and you accepted him as your savior and the boss of your life. And when you don't do it, he's going to chasten you. And then you get what? Don't expect to receive anything from God. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Christians have a big responsibility and accountability that they don't think that they have. God is easier on unbelievers than he is his own people. Because his own people are enlightened. They're not enlightened. They're ignorant. We are not ignorant. Ignorant is not, ignorance is not bliss, especially in this church, when I teach the Bible from Genesis to Revelation to you. Believe me, every time I enlighten you with something, you're responsible to obey it. You know that, right? Yeah. It has nothing to do with me anymore. God gives me the word to give to you. Once you know it, then you reject it. You're actually rebelling against God. And he said rebellion is as evil as witchcraft. And we said, wow, I rebel against God all the time. You mean I'm a witch? That's what he's saying. It's just as evil as being a witch. I said, wow, I didn't think I was that bad of a person. And that's why everybody's bad. Can I get an amen here? Amen. Everybody rebels against God in one form or another. And that is why he corrects us and he chastens us and he disciplines us. And then we go, why God? Why are you doing this to me? I'm a good person. I go to church and read my Bible. <laughs> we, we what? We base our relationship with God on our performance yeah. instead of our faith and our obedience. Jesus said... If you love me, you will obey me. obey me. He didn't say, if you love me, you'll come to church. If you love me, you'll serve me. If you love me, you'll, I'll, I'll put money in the basket. No, he says, you'll obey me. I'm telling you not to do that. Why are you still doing it? You're still doing it because you want to still do it. You can't blame anybody else anymore. You can't say, well, I had a rough day, so I had to do something. Who doesn't have a rough day? Is anybody in here have a rough day? <laughs> yes. I, the moment I get up in the morning, my day is rough. Yeah. The devil is all over me as soon as I yeah. open my eyes. True. And it's not even out what it's in me. He's on me for everything. Yeah. Yeah. Inward battles. Inward battles. The struggles are vicious. Especially in a leadership position. You decide to serve the Lord and get in his army, you can expect the attacks to intensify yes. 20 times more than they ever were. Because yeah. he wants you up. And he wants you to bring others out. Mm -hmm. so, that, so what happens if the, if the leadership fails, then the whole uh, church fails. Uh -huh. yeah. Slowly and subtly. Yeah. And that's why the church is in such apostasy today. Because instead they're following religion instead of following Jesus. Can I get an amen here? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Which is, means nothing to God. Religion is, Jesus hated religion. He went after the Pharisees. Mm -hmm. He told them, you're whitewashed tombs. You're, 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 you're beautiful on the outside, but inside you're full of what? Dead men's bones and yeah. self-indulgence. Wouldn't it be a wise thing to do is turn your will and your life over to his care? Yeah. That's what step three is all about. Because if you don't, once you accept, well, what? Jesus is like the mafia. Once you're in, you can't get out. <laughs> you can't get out. No, you just can't leave. You can't get out. So in other words, he's going to discipline you until you actually do it. You can get spanked all the way to heaven, or you can get, uh, let me just make this little explanation. Two people are going to Florida. They both jump on the plane, okay? One of them trusts the pilot. He sits back, he reads a book, takes a nap. The other guy don't trust the pilot. He's looking out the window, to get the turbulent. He's going like this. He's looking around. They both get there and they both land safely. Who enjoyed the trip? <coughs> if you don't trust Jesus, you're not going to enjoy this trip at all. You're always going to be wondering and wishy-washy and I got to take it, I got to take control of this, I got to do this. Mm -hmm. Because you're not trusting the pilot. Right. And it's all without faith. Faith is trust. It's impossible to please God. Mm -hmm. Anybody believes in him, Right, but believe that he exists and he's a reward of those who diligently seek him. So you have to seek him in everything that's going on in your life. Saying, Lord, where's, where are you in this? What is your purpose in this? What are you doing? What are you trying to show me here? Yeah. That's when you're a mature Christian. You understand, whatever's coming at you, the Lord is trying to what? Teach you something through every adversity and every challenge in your life. And that's why you have to make a decision and let him, let him be the navigator. Let him be the pilot. Give him the keys. How many times do we give him the keys? 
and then say, oh, well, it's taking a little too long, Lord, I'm going to have to help you out. Let me, let, me, let me get you a little, a little quicker. See, we want our spirituality quicker than God's going to... See, to, for something to change and something to last, it takes a long time to change. And it takes... To, for something to have quality, you know, something that's... Um, they do something quick. You ever see them new houses, those modular houses? They put them up in like three days. They're built out of cardboard. They might last 15, 20 years, and they got to redo it. The same one that builds it from the ground up, structure with the, with the two by fours and the right plywood and everything else will last a lot longer. Amen? So if you want your spiritual life to last a lot longer and your recovery to last a lot longer, you have to what? Let God build a quality life into you. And that takes time. Amen. Amen. And that's why you have to give yourself a lot of room to grow, a lot of grace and mercy, and you also have to give what? Other people the same. Mm -hmm. How many people are short with people still? Hmm? Does anybody have a legitimate excuse for being short with other people? And let me tell you something, especially when you know that God wants you to be patient. And you actually say, I'm not going to be patient, I'm rebelling against God. That's just the bottom line. And don't expect to get blessed, you're going to be miserable. Because you're going to be miserable because you're not getting your way. Instead of saying, hey, you know what? This might not ever change, i got to accept it. I fought against traffic for so many years and I'm still fighting it here and there. But I'm saying none of it's changing. If I don't accept it, it's yeah, never going to change. So in other words, I'll be miserable every time I get in my car. It gets worse before it gets better. Yeah, and, and it always gets worse before it gets better. All the construction, you, you don't have to So choice. you have to understand, you have to be patient, and you have to make a decision every day mm -hmm. to turn your will and life over to his care, mm -hmm. or you're going to be one miserable Christian. Yeah. That's right. That's why it's the best thing to do is leave it in his hands. Amen? Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, thank you. Let me share that with me. Answer some questions. <laughs>